Hi Bobcats! In this and the next couple of sections, we're going to take a look at some basic ideas of chemistry. Um, I hope that you've seen something about some of these ideas in the past. I, everything we're doing right now is just, just very superficial. This is like to try to uh, help you access some of those dusty parts of your brain that maybe you haven't thought about in a while. Nothing too deep in this chapter. And if for you it happens to be this is your first time to ever see these ideas, don't worry about it. Um, try to, to, to take these ideas at just a very superficial level um, as we are right now. And then in the remaining chapters, we're going to develop these much more thoroughly. It just helps uh, to try to make some connections to prior knowledge uh, when we get to those later chapters. So I just want to start planting that seed at this point. Our objective for this section is to superficially review the atomic level description of matter. So what is an atom? An atom is the smallest particle of an element that still is that element. So for instance, aluminum is an element, and you can imagine taking a piece of aluminum foil and ripping it into smaller and smaller pieces. You get down to the point you've got to have little microscopic tweezers to, to break off a tinier and tinier piece of aluminum. Well, when you get down to that last tiniest bit that still is aluminum, we would call that last little particle of aluminum an atom. Each element has a unique atom, and this is a great opportunity to introduce the concept of macro scale versus micro scale. Macro scale means the scale of matter that we can actually work with in lab, things that we can touch, quantities that are large enough that we can put them on a balance, which is what chemists call a scale. We can put, put uh, a sample on a scale and weigh it because it's big enough to do that. Um, the micro scale, which is also sometimes these days referred to as the nano scale, uh, means the atomic level, things that are so tiny we really can't see individual atoms, we really can't touch and manipulate individual atoms. Um, so, but, but the atomic model that we use um, is really, really useful. So we, we, we try to make correlations between what's going on at the atomic scale or the micro scale with things that we can do in lab or on the macro scale. And then one last little bit at this point about atoms. Um, atoms are actually composed of smaller bits that are called protons, neutrons, and electrons. We have three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. In a solid, if you look at how the particles are arranged, uh, the particles are really close to one another. There's usually some kind of order or symmetry to the arrangement of the particle. You can see here in this diagram that um, the particles are arranged kind of in these diagonal rolls. Oops, didn't highlight that very well, um, but in these diagonal rows, there's a, a pattern or symmetry to how the particles are arranged. Um, and the particles really don't move. They're in these positions, and they might vibrate uh, a little bit. They might rotate while they're sitting in their positions, but they really are pretty well fixed to a position. In the case of a liquid, the particles also are very close to one another, just like in the solid state but the particles are moving. So even though they're, they're shoulder to shoulder, all of these particles are moving around um, and bumping into one another. The gas phase, though, has the particles uh, separated by big dif distances. Um, one of the ways it gets phrased when we discuss the kinetic molecular theory of gases in a later chapter is that the spacing between the particles is much greater than the size of the particles themselves. And also in a gas, the particles are continually moving relative to one another. 
matter gets broken down into all of these different categories. Um, historically, this was done by trying to separate matter and to try to get a pure form of matter. Um, I have a hard time thinking about it that way. I actually much prefer these uh, cartoons that are drawn down here that are showing you the atomic description of these different types of matter. If we have something that is an element, that element will be made up of just one type of atom. It's illustrated by all of these gold atoms from, from this gold coin. If we have something that's a compound, like water being shown in this glass, a compound is composed of two different elements chemically combined. And so that's being shown in this cartoon with these um, uh, water molecules made up of both hydrogen and oxygen. If we're talking about a homogeneous mixture, um, I, yes, a homogeneous mixture. Um, we're talking about something like these gold rings. Uh, pure gold is super soft, so if you're going to put any stress on it, like in the form of a ring, you want to mix it with some other element, maybe silver, platinum, and that mixture is much, much tougher, much harder than pure gold, and we call that a homogeneous mixture. Uh, chemists will also um, use the word uniform. It's a uniform mixture, and another buzzword for that is solution. Um, a heterogeneous mixture is one where you can see different phases. Um, so for instance, when this person's panning for gold, you can see the water and you can also see the gold nuggets. So all of those ideas that were illustrated with diagrams on the previous slide here are written out more in words. Um, an element is made up of a single kind of atom. A compound is made up of two or more elements chemically combined. A substance can be either a pure element or a compound. And I'd just like to point out that this word substance is something that I personally struggled with. I made it all the way through getting a bachelor's and a PhD in chemistry, and I'd been teaching for about two years before it finally dawned on me that when the textbooks were using the word substance, it had a very specific definition, that it's either a pure element or a compound, because in common usage, substance has a very, very different meaning. Um, and so in chemistry, it, the, the, in, in general usage, we use substance in a much broader sense. It, it can be a synonym for matter, but in chemistry, substance means a very particular type of matter, either that pure element or a compound. And then a mixture is made up of two or more substances combined together. And if it's a homogeneous mixture, you can see only one phase and the uh, chemists usually call these homogeneous mixtures solutions. Solutions can be liquids like the saline solution that you might use for contact lenses, um, or they can be other states of matter such as a, a, a solid like the uh, ring that was shown on the previous page. And then a heterogeneous mixture is one where you can actually see more than one phase present. Physical properties are properties of matter that can be observed uh, without changing the identity of the substance. Um, I really want to focus for physical and chemical on the concept of identity. If um, we're not changing the identity, it's either a physical property that we're observing or a, um, a physical change. But if we if the process we're looking at is changing the identity of the substance, then we're going to call that a chemical property or a chemical change. So this chart lists some of these examples um, of physical properties, things like uh, boiling point, color, things of that nature. Chemical properties are uh, things that we observe if we change the identity of the substance. Um, so for instance, something like rusting, where we change iron into iron oxide. Iron is a hard, strong metal. Iron oxide or rust is this kind of orangish, uh, really flaky, not strong stuff. Um, so anytime we're changing the identity of a substance, we're observing a chemical property in the process of a chemical change. 
So physical versus chemical changes are outlined here. Uh, when we do physical changes, we're going to keep the same chemical identity or composition. Um, mixing, dilution, and changing state are the most common examples of physical changes we'll see in chemistry. And when I'm talking about um, state changes, I'm talking about things like melting, where a solid uh, changes into a liquid and uh, chemical changes are ones where the um, uh, chemical identity or composition is changed. Uh, that'll be things like burning, uh, corrosion, reactivity. And I want to point out a misconception that students sometimes have, which has to do with reversibility at very introductory levels to this topic, people often talk about reversibility, that if something, if a change is reversible, it's going to be a physical change. If it's not reversible, it's a chemical change. But if you look really closely at that criteria, it just totally falls apart. Um, for instance, um, they'll say that um, uh, cutting a piece of paper in two is a physical change, but you can't reverse that. Um, you, you can't, at an atomic level, undo the cut that you just made. And many chemical changes are reversible. In Gen Chem 2, which is a different course that I often teach, we actually spend three chapters of that textbook talking about reversible chemical changes. They're known as equilibria. So we don't want to deal with reversibility. Um, what we want to focus on instead is the identity or the composition. If the composition changes, it's a chemical change or a chemical property. If the composition does not change, then it's physical. So this clicker question is asking, which of the following is a chemical change? Well, um, let's kind of analyze this. Water is H2O, liquid water. And when it changes into ice, it's still water. It's just going from the liquid state to the solid state. When water evaporates, we're starting with liquid water, and it's ending up as water in the gas phase. That's sometimes called steam, it's sometimes called water vapor or humidity, but it's still water once it's in the gas phase. As butter melts in a hot pan, we have butter starting off, and then as it melts, it's still butter. Now that's assuming that you're just melting, you aren't scorching or caramelizing or anything like that. We're just, just taking solid butter and turning it into liquid butter. Um, if we have a bicycle left outdoors and it begins to rest somewhere there on the frame, well, that frame is steel, which is mostly iron. And as it rests, it, and it, so it changes into rust, um, that rust is going to be chemicals like Fe2O3. It's picked up some oxygen and it's become brittle. When we have sugar dissolving in hot coffee, we're starting with sugar and unsweetened coffee. And when we mix those two things together, now we're ending up with sweetened coffee which is, uh, let's see, that's going to be sugar mixed with coffee. You can still taste that both of those things are present. The process we're doing there is just mixing. So the only thing here that is a chemical change is answer D. Circling back to our objective, we wanted to superficially look at this atomic description of matter. And so we looked at what's an atom, we looked at some of the different classifications of matter like solid liquid gas or substance versus mixture, element versus compound, those types of things. And then um, using the criteria of the composition or identity to distinguish uh, physical properties and changes from chemical properties and changes.